Okay, welcome to a very special edition of Spark Central's Drop In and Write Community Writing Workshop. Uh, we are here today to have um, seven of our regular attendees give a public reading of their uh, personal creative work as part of the Get Lit Literary Festival um, 2021. Uh, so before we dive in, a couple of words about Spark Central and a couple of words about Get Lit. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with Spark Central and is watching this as part of the Get Lit Festival, um, Spark Central is a nonprofit in Spokane, Washington, um, the mission of which is to break barriers to creativity by offering transformative programs, access to technology, and a welcoming creative community, um, all free thanks to community support from people like you. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of your YouTube channel, um, there's an option to donate to Get Lit, which is awesome. And there's also an option to donate to Spark Central. Um, if you have the means, uh, we would love your support. Um, Drop In and Write is one of Spark Central's um, uh, weekly uh, programs uh, that is offered as of right now over the internet um, in which uh, legions of us gather from all over the Pacific Northwest at this point uh, to talk about writing, to share writing, and to otherwise just be big nerds about storytelling. And uh, we do some uh, creative exercises together too. Um, and there's some really excellent work that gets um, forged in the fires of this program, and we're going to hear some of it tonight. Uh, all right, so this event, as I mentioned, is part of the Get Lit Festival, which is an annual literary festival that traditionally takes place at many venues throughout Spokane, including at Spark Central. It's a perennial favorite. This year, Get Lit is all virtual, um, and almost all of their programming is free. Learn more about Get Lit, find other events to attend, or donate to support their program by visiting Get Lit Festival. Dot org. And now that I've said all of those things, I should say, my name is Jenny. Hi. <laughs> and uh, uh, along with Ben Simons and Hannah Engel, um, we co-pilot the Drop-In and Write program, which is how we ended up before you today. <clears throat> so um, yeah, that's where we're at. Thank you very much, Get Lit, for having us. Um, thank you to Drop-In and Write and the Drop-In and Write community for uh, coming to support us. And uh, we're about to hear some cool stuff. Um, Okay, so let us begin. Um, our first reader tonight is John Browning. John Browning lives with his wife and two cats in Spokane's West Central neighborhood. He's a teacher by vocation and a poet by nature. He has a BA in creative writing and a secondary English education, both from Eastern Washington University. John, take it away. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give a warning. There's one swear word at the end of my piece, um, and it's a flash fiction piece called Where the Water Flows. The boy races to keep up with his mother in gray downtown Tacoma drizzle. His feet stumble on wet cement between decaying buildings under clouds like an ocean of bruised milk. She grasps his hand tightly. They are rushing north against the rain so they are soaked in the front and dry in the back. The boy begins to cry. The mother turns to him, her left eye swollen and blue like an overripe plum, then moves forward, walking slower. The boy was proud of his knowledge of bruises. At first, they were hot like a fever. Then they get fat. They would turn black purple, then fade and fade to fuchsias and yellow until they shrunk and faded away as if nothing ever happened. That morning, the mother had packed a small suitcase and hauled them to a bus, screaming a mantra of rage the entire way. Climbing onto the bus, she says good morning to the driver with a hoarse voice. The driver keeps his face forward, said nothing at all, drives away as the mother and child took a seat toward the back of the bus. The mother was fat with child, trapped in her womb now seven months. The boy had opened his coloring book, dinosaurs. He colored, trying to stay in the lines, but only had gray, blue, and black crayons. The mother and child sit in the bus stop shelter, which protects them from the rain, but drips everywhere. It is pouring now, and the gutters become trash-filled creeks swirling toward choked storm drains. 
Pigeons and seagulls snatch flowing food while marching ankle deep in the eddies. The mother gets up and nearly drags the child across the street to the YWCA. She tries to rent a room but doesn't have enough money. Her purse is loaded with change for the bus but no bills. The man lets them sit in the lobby, which is spotless and sterile white. It has a chill like frosted bone. It is like living in a Russian egg eggshell room inside eggshell sky. The boy realizes he has lost his crayons. The mother hands him a golden book, Futility. He throws it to the ground. He wants to be home where it is warm, where he has his toys and lunch. His stomach rumbles. He begins to bawl, sobbing, gasping. The mother asks if she can use the phone. The sun has come out, peeking through the clouds, swimming like puffy fish. The mother mopes down the street when they come to a poster. It is a circus poster filled with colorful animals, animals, zebras, giraffes, lions, elephants. Do you want to look at the animals, she says, her voice still hoarse, but kind. No. They continue down the street. The boy changes his mind. I want to see the animals. It's too late. You had your chance. I want to see the animals. No, it's too late, we gotta go. The mother is screaming between clenched teeth, a locked jaw. I want to see the animals. And the boy begins to wail. The mother makes a fist and brings it down on the boy, hitting him in the face. Blood begins to gush out the boy's mouth and nose. Raising her fist again, she feels multiple eyes on her. People had stopped walking on the sidewalk and were looking at her with voiceless horror. It's okay. We're okay, she smiled, exposing a split lip. The boy looks down at the water flowing into the gutter, blood dripping into it and creating beautiful anemones. They quickly dissolve into colorless nothingness. His face is hot. It is the warmest the boy had felt all day. The people, encumbered with umbrellas, purses, and briefcases, resume their daily activities. Stop crying, the mother bowed down and whispered, spitting in a hanky and rubbing it against his face roughly. Pull your head back and squeeze your nose. They walk to Woolworths, where the boy hopes to get a hot chocolate or look at the toys. Dad arrives in his beat up cutlass. The car is a warrior. This survived many wrecks. The boy hears its rumble, a dragon's purr. Dad opens the door. Horse's head, Dad laughs, picking up his son. The boy felt his whiskers and smells aqua velva as his dad gives him a hungry hug. The mom picks up her briefcase and lets herself into the car. The back of the car is warm and the window's foggy. The mother is crumpled into her seat up front. Motherfucker, she whispers. And before the boy falls in the sweep, his dad looks at her, menacing me. Good, the boy thinks. She deserves it. That's him. Oh, thank you very much for that, John. Thank you very much for that. Okay, next up we have Ren. Ren is an avid reader and writer who had the idea to start a novel in the second grade and fell in love with creative writing. She is currently writing a murder mystery novel that is fantasy based. All right, Ren, you're up. Mine had no title originally, but I called it The Captain. The forest was darker than usual in the arboretum of the starship, but the captain liked it that way. She liked the nighttime sounds as much as the next person, but nobody walked through the arboretum at night. Beneath the chirps of crickets and on, the ongoing cries of the cicadas, there was hidden danger. The captain, a battle-hardened woman of 28, enjoyed the danger that the nighttime arboretum provided. She liked the odd solace it provided, the unknown danger and the excitement it brought. Her name was Saren Lewis, and she was captain of the science ship Highlander on its third mission with her as captain. She'd readily replaced the former captain, Justin Smith, after he'd had an accident and unfortunately passed from his wounds from trying to inspect 
an unknown plant a little too closely. The crew had been slow to warm up to Saren after learning that she had previously been on a warship and fighting a dangerous enemy, but then found that her scientific curiosity greatly outweighed the battle-hardened front she had put on at first arriving on the Highlander. Now she spent most of her time on board with her attention split between the science officer and her own duties. The crew had gotten to know her fairly well after her negotiation techniques had gotten them out of trouble with one of the other starships. Saren looked up when she heard someone page her from the bridge. They'd been tracking a ship's distress signal, and she was interested to see what they'd found. She hurried to the bridge, only to freeze when she saw what was on the screen. Is this a joke, Lieutenant? Saren snapped. No, ma'am. It looks like a hive ship has entered our territory. That's where the signal signal's coming from, Ander, the lieutenant said. The hive was the scariest thing outside of seeing an Asian giant hornet inside a beehive. The ship was easily 100 times bigger than the average starship, looking like an enormous nest and probably just as busy. Nobody who had the unfortunate business of running into a hive ship had the privilege of walking away unscathed. Those who did didn't live long enough to talk about it. Ma'am, it looks like the hive ship is heavily damaged by proton cannon fire. I wonder if the ship got disconnected from their queen because the drones inside got infected, Anders said. Hail the ship. See if there are any survivors, Saren quipped sharply. Ma'am, I'm going to have to advise against that, Ares, the head of security, warned. Them hive ships are as dangerous as anything in space. Saren nodded and walked towards the viewing screen. Be me aboard. I want to see what's going on, Saren said. She was determined to find out what happened. She, he nodded and let another officer beam her aboard after taking, talking her into at least taking a weapon and safety equipment. She immediately had the feeling that something terrible had happened. There were bodies of the members of Hive Origin on the ground everywhere. She got closer, feeling that there was more to meet the eye. She noticed odd markings on the members of the crew. She pressed the comm that linked her to the crew that was in her ear. Yes, ma'am, came the voice of Anders. Patch me through to Medbay. I have a serious question for Dr. Kai if she's available, she said, worried. The line went quiet for a moment to the, for the transfer to a different area of the ship before a new feminine voice came on the comms. Dr. Kai here. Go ahead, Captain, the woman drawled. You could take the girl from the islands, but you couldn't take the islands from the girl, it seems. Kai, I need information on re recent skin diseases, preferably one that leaves marks on the extremities of non-humans, Saren said. All right, give me a second. Typing could be heard over the comms. Looks like there's one new illness listed. Could you describe the pattern, Kai asked. Okay, it looks like a leopard print with dots in the middle, Saren murmured. Oh boy, that can wipe out anything. It luckily can't infect humans, but you'll need to quarantine for 24 hours once you come back, Kai said. Understood. I'm getting out of here, Saren said. Good idea. Kai, out. The comms went silent. Saren was beamed aboard and was placed in quarantine as soon as she was back on the ship. Luckily, there, were all, there was always something to do in quarantine. She had no ill effects after 24 hours and a thorough inspection by Dr. Kai. Shortly after, she resumed her normal duties and continued her research as planned. They moved on from the ship and continued as normal, discovering new things just as they always had. The end. Hey. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us, Ron. Thank you. Um, all right, chugging right along. Next up, we have Reagan. Reagan Lane is a speech language pathologist living in Spokane, Washington. She has two boys and a dog that keep her on her toes. The work she'll be sharing is a series of prose poems, all loosely touching on the subject of parenthood. All right, Reagan, all yours. It was late, like black, black, ears ringing kind of late. 
The whirr of the fan of the stove growled in my brain, burrowed down into my belly where it ached. I hated it, hated that fan. She put it on to protect us from the secondhand smoke and I hated it. I padded down the hall to the kitchen where she sat smoking, drinking. Doctor said if she drank with all the medication, she'd die, die. And she just slumped there next to the stove, making her endless lists, killing herself with tar and that fermented jug of blood. Go to bed, go to bed, please, just go, I begged. She looked at me with glazed, half-lidded eyes. How was she even conscious? You should be asleep, she slurred. She pushed herself up and tottered towards me. Put you to bed, my beautiful Anneli data. I stepped back. Don't touch me. Go to sleep. You can't drink like this. You'll die. She laughed and tried to pet my head. I was already taller than her. I pushed her hand away. Knock it off. I'm serious. Go. Go. I was yelling. Boop, boop, boop. She did a little shuffling dance. See, I'm fine. You don't worry about me. I'm the mom. I was mad. So mad. She made the acid in my stomach burn at the back of my throat. This wilted, squashed version of my brilliant mother. I shoved past her. And she collapsed. Fluidly. Like she just folded in on herself, balled up, covered her head. No, 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 please stop. Daddy, please don't hurt me anymore. It was a tiny lisping voice, a baby voice over and over. Please, daddy, please don't hurt me anymore. I backed away. I deserve to die. I deserve to die. I ran to the door, out into the falling snow. The flakes were huge, the kind that looked like blobs of cotton drifting in slow motion. They sucked my eyelashes, coated my pajamas, trickled my bare feet. I ran. I suppose it all came from too much Laura Ingalls Wilder. There was always someone about to die in the snow, lost in a blizzard, freezing to death, a soft, sleepy death. I veered off the robe into the ditch and sat. The blobs of cotton continued to fall as if the world hadn't ended. I started to ache. The bones in my feet were screaming. Drips of melt water trailed down my face, hung with agonized itch at the tip of my nose. I wondered how long until I started to feel tired. My little brother was crying. He'd come out after me, crying in that little kid way that made my lungs close up and gripped my knees hard to my chest. I couldn't die. What would happen to him? I unlocked my fingers, creaking knees, took three tries to get upright and out of the ditch. Everything hurt. His arms bound my waist and he clung there as I dragged us both home, put us to bed. So I have a second one. The title is Mama. I got caught up last week digging through my mom's poetry. Mountains turned haze smooth, pale gold grass. Red relic berries torch this pearled sky. Only gray puffs of breath say I'm here. Here is a place to take a stand. She died three years ago. I miss her. I abhor very nice lady, my only claim to remembrance. I watch myself a slug emerge from that fat tomato mold, no teeth seeking great white buffalo. She died unexpectedly. I held her burning arm while her family gathered around her, even her father. In red suspenders and blue slick pants that heavy veined man crawls through life, he could be the symbol of dark eternity and bed of nails. She was intubated, drugged heavily, her dead innards in a surgical pan two floors down. She'd been unconscious and had, since I'd arrived hours before. Her eyes opened once, membranes thick, swollen, yellowed at the sound of her father's voice. Her mouth worked around the tube. Her eyes closed, weary. I know, after all, how you hate me with overused love in your mouth and that boundary around your heart, like the line my sister drew with yellow chalk to separate our room, our belongings, to prove how far away I was. He jumped up, old, but still agile. Open your eyes, he demanded. 
Her eyes reopened and she looked at him, only him. His other daughters clustered around him. She only responds to you, talk to her, keep talking. You're my good girl, yes, you're my good girl. She furrowed her brow and looked, was it confused, hurt, apologetic? I couldn't tell, she closed her eyes again. Damn you, open your fat eyes. His face was close, nearly touching hers. Her eyes puckered at the borders, lids tight. Her head pressed back into the pillow. I must understand, or please, or placate, or maneuver or manipulate, or obey, not in creation of this soul, in reflection of another, in destruction of myself. I left the crowded room, walked to the nurse's station. When can we start the comfort care? I asked. That's what they call pulling the plug. I guess if there's alliteration, it's easier. Abrupt and candid termination wails in the heaven, harsh, cruel. I gather skulls, glitter of winter wings, serenity like jewels, topaz, dreams, British Celts, strength in their bones, freedom in their brains, flourish brilliant swords, brilliant trumpets, alarm remembering, pearl mummies dumb from pyramids, thick and blunt as truth. I miss her. I'm glad she's gone. I wish she could have left earlier. Her favorite song, the one we played at her graveside, was I'll Fly Away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah by and by, I'll fly away. Her coffin was lined with pink satin. The handles worked in roses. According to her specifications given years before, she wore a pink ballet skirt, leotard and point shoes and a custom made Marilyn Monroe mask. Her crypt was sparkly pink as if a child had decorated it with crayons and glitter. Her stone with carved draping lily had no dates inscribed, just her name and woman of no age. This is me, heir to the red poppies raging in the naked wind. Goodbye care in tempo of brass bells, clanging a cold massive endeavor to make glad effect. All the poetry is hers. I'll Fly Away was written by George Jones and Albert Brumley. That's all I have time for. Wow. Uh, thank you, Reagan. Thank you, Reagan. Very, very powerful imagery there. Um, <clears throat> awesome. Next up, we have Hannah. Hannah. Engel received her MFA in poetry from Eastern Washington University in 2020. She lives in Spokane with her husband, houseplants, and precariously stacked towers of books. Hannah? Hi. Um, so I have three poems. Um, so the first one is Autumn Sinquains. Someone forgot to turn off the sprinklers tonight. Air below freezing, sheets of ice, coat leaves, iced over, blades of grass bl bright outside my car's windows while I drive at midnight looking for calm. I once was supple, soft, before cold night sprinkled apprehension on me and I froze. Layered and frozen drops, each blade is unnatural, yet glistening softly brings me delight. And me, driving alone until I can reassemble myself, who will be delighted with me? The crew of Apollo 13 reports from lunar orbit. Houston, now that your radio waves can't reach, all we hear is the regular beeping of life support, pathetic buzzing of the alarm that tells us we have little water left. We ignore the dying alarms, ignore the silence that follows their death, ignore the cold. Jim says he sees a moon monster in the shadows. He keeps yelling, there it is, and then floats away, doubled over laughing. Jack watches the dials in case we orbit ourselves into gimbal lock. Our radio waves disturb the still surface of the moon. Old jokes are suddenly funny again. Fred slaps his knees, says, tell it again, the one about the talking dog. And we tell it again because here we remember only three jokes. And in the other two, everyone dies alone. If mission control could reach us here, they would say, curl up in the cold capsule, leave consciousness behind a while. We open another pack of caffeine tablets. 
We don't sleep, but we still dream. All of us, the same fevered caffeine dream, a childhood day marred by finding a dead baby rabbit on the road. Even then, now, realizing no earth thing goes on forever. And you were there, Houston, pacing in meetings, flipping switches attached to nothing. Houston, we dream of you. And finally, descending. You are sitting somewhere in the sky and the pilot has turned off the cabin lights. The windows shut out glowing cities below. You set your book down, settle yourself into the rigid seat and try to sleep. Silent wings bring you closer to me, descending in swoops that drop your stomach with you. Weariness still clings to you like stray dust in your pockets. And I am trying not to miss you. You will be here soon. The plane's wingtips illuminate, casting small lights into the sky between us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, so I want to just take a pause here and admire the work that we've heard so far, John, Ren, Rick, and Hannah. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Thank you so much for bringing it tonight. Um, so we're about halfway through. Um, Next up is Zanri, and Zanri has requested that I read her work for her. Uh, so to be very, very clear, the work that's about to be read is Zanri's, not mine. Um, but let's say a little bit about her. Uh, Zanri is a writer and an illustrator who lives in a small town in the Northwest. The work she's sharing tonight is the preface to a novel she's working on called A Sacred Monster. So I will read the preface to a sacred monster. Now. <clears throat> Silence is broken in a sparse wood by leaves scraping against each other. Within the thinnest spaces between the trees, a runner and her loud labored breathing cut through the calm, quiet air. The noise she makes as her feet stir up the moss coated ground carry spar, but alerts nothing and no one. Behind her, the same sound of running echoes. Her pursuers are faster and stronger, but far enough behind that they must pause frequently to correct what poor visibility has afforded them. Misdirection being her only option, the runner tightens the corners of her turns as she continues to zigzag back and forth. Her destination, just over a hill beyond the trees, will have to wait until she widens the distance between herself and the seven men following her. But she mustn't wait too long. Her stamina is finite and the steep hill a looming factor. She pauses for a breath, calculating the men's proximity from the sound of their footsteps. It is a distant, low noise. This might be her only chance. She hesitates for an instant before bolting out of the woods and into the open field. Grasping with her hands at any branch or stem strong enough to support her weight, she begins to ascend the grassy incline. At the top, she pauses once again, choking for air. She can only faintly hear the coarse yelling from below over the loud, pulsing heartbeat reverberating behind her ears. Now the danger is glaringly real and she has lost any chance of rest. Her aching legs are reluctantly set in motion again as she resumes the tedious task of escape. She cannot see it, but she can feel it. Her destination is close. She gambles all the energy she has left and forces herself into a sprint. She can't tell how close the men are anymore. Seeing nothing but a blur of green and gold scenery, she closes her eyes and tries to determine the exact place. She can feel it clearly now, not so far away, and hear it as well. She can feel the ground opening up and hear the wailing of flexing metal. Her breathing is painful as she makes the final dash to safety. At last, she senses a darkness closing in, a shadowy lid covering her from above and the ground safely swallowing her from the inside. She's made it with time to spare. The men, winded and fatigued, stagger up to the space that had until recently been occupied by the young girl. Here, embedded in the ground, they see a large circle of metal, an ancient entrance. Shapes and symbols, all clicking and swirling around each other, link into place as the door bars itself from entry by force. Staring blankly at this sight, a dismal feeling of defeat and resentment spreads through the ranks of these latecomers. Emotions begin to reveal themselves. There is cursing in this piece. Son of a bitch. Fucking goddammit. Fuck you, stupid bitch. Just got out here, goddammit. She just got in. Fuck. The leader, a thick-set man taller than the rest, wordlessly wipes sweat off his forehead with the back of his hand. After allowing his comrades a moment to vent their frustration, he calls them to attention. Hey, hey, stop it, why don't you look? Just look. Where is she going to go, okay? She's stuck in there, right? Look, 
So what? He gestures at the entrance, trying to bring his men's focus back to the matter at hand. We just need to wait here. Wait for her to come out again, yeah? Stop yelling. Calm down, Christ. All we have to do is wait. The men, silenced but not entirely reassured, look at each other uncertainly. Striving to maintain order and solidarity in the group, the leader kneels down over the barrier and speaks in an indifferent tone to the solid metal disc. Well, it looks like you've found yourself a great little hidey hole there, Missy. I guess you should congratulate yourself. You gonna be there long? I only ask as well, maybe you don't wanna stay down there forever. All of us up here, I mean, we've got plenty of time to kill. Actually, we've got all the time in the world. Not like we've got a hell load of flaming hot dates planned in our calendars, right guys? The men, now understanding his meaning more clearly, snicker and smile at each other. They're relieved of their worry and reunited once more behind their leader. I mean, I don't want you feeling shy. You can come out and talk whenever. We don't bite or nothing. We just want to talk, all right? Like, how is it you can open up these things? You got a secret password? We just want to talk and find out some stuff. That's all. Nothing more to it, honest. I'm going to take your time and think on it because we're not going anywhere. Satisfied, he steps away over to his second in command. Set up camp right there next to that slope so she can't see us from here. We'll starve her out. When she gets tired and hungry, she'll have to come back up and then we give her a nice surprise. Got it? At a practice pace, the men begin to busy themselves with routine scavenging, looking here and there for firewood and soft pieces of ground to settle on. The leader, glancing around one final time, turns his back to the conduit and starts to walk away. He only takes a few steps, however, before he stops again, this time tense and alert. A strange noise has reached his ears, a hollow, unnatural buzzing that he cannot identify. Somehow coming from everywhere and nowhere, it steadily rises. The others all stop as well, looking around for the source of the sound. Louder still, it grows to a fierce, alarming pitch. Turning back apprehensively, the leader is the first of the group to notice movement. The embedded shapes and symbols in the time-worn hatch commence their clicking and swirling once again, and small slots in the circle begin opening up. Suddenly, an aggressive of metallic humming and glittering streams out from these new openings. A cloud of unidentifiable shapes, too fast and fleeting to be perceived, spirals high up into the air, casting a ripple, rippling shadow over the mystified onlookers. Then, just as suddenly, it descends. The men have only seconds to feel horror and confusion before the turbulent mass engulfs them all in a chaotic storm. Gleaming, clicking, twitching edges pelt the yelling, struggling men, mercilessly cutting through exposed skin and clothing. Punching and swatting vainly at the air around them, the men are too slow and unprepared to protect themselves. Even their leader, roaring and snarling in agony and indignation, is forced to bend to the pressure and retreats back into the wood, desperate for any kind of cover from the unforgiving onslaught. Staggering and screaming through the scattering of trees, the band of wounded comrades and their cries of distress slowly fade into the distance of the lush countryside. A slight breeze unsettles the wild grasses of the field. No birds call to each other, and no animals can be heard rustling through the undergrowth. Nothing is out of the ordinary in this flourishing landscape. Nothing except the large, heavy metal circle of a door, haloed by dirt and cryptic meaning, bonded into the ground. The men in the swarm are gone. All that is left is calm, resolute nature. Once more, there is silence. And that's the end of that piece. Thank you very much, Zanary. Fantastic. Um, okay. Next up, we have Larry. Larry Plager joined the Larry Plager, excuse me, joined the Marine Corps after graduating high school in Spokane. Went to Vietnam in early January 1969, where he started as a rifleman and finished his tour as a squad leader. The work he's sharing is one of his memoirs from this time. Larry, it's all you. Uh, this piece is called A Morning in Vietnam, and there are curse words in this piece. I sit on the edge of my foxhole with my boots braced on the front side, facing outside a perimeter, a poncho liner draped over my shoulders against the chill. My M16 rests across my lap, and in front of the foxhole lie two hand grenades and an open entrenching tool. The E-tool might be useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat if the enemy overruns us. But the night remains quiet for our perimeter. It's always a good day when nothing happens. 
This combat operation has completed 23 days, and this is the 23rd place we have spent the night, the 23rd day without a shower, the 23rd day wearing the same clothes, and the 23rd day eating sea rations. It is now 0600, and everyone on watch wakes up their team members, and the listening post and the ambush teams will return to our perimeter. I wake Shorty and Chicago, who lay curled up on the ground, wrapped in their poncho liners. We usually called each other by our last names or nicknames. Shorty was short, and Chicago was, well, from Chicago. No nickname for me, just Plegger. I take a camel cigarette out of a sea rat four pack, tap it to pack the tobacco and light it with my Zippo lighter. After taking a deep drag, I pull out the only food left in my pack, a can of ham and lima beans and one of fruit cocktail. I would never say this was my last meal. Also, I would never say I was smoking my last cigarette. We consider it bad luck to say so or do so. We should be resupplied today, hopefully. Last month on another operation, we went three days without food. I will save the fruit cocktail and one cigarette until we are resupplied, no matter how hungry I get or how badly I want to smoke. The ham and lima beans were so disliked, we called them ham and motherfuckers. The ham tasted okay, but the lima beans, tasty crap. This morning, I have to eat them cold. Seldom, uh, I have to eat them cold. We seldom get heat tabs when we receive our sea rats and we often use C4 plastic explosives from broken Claymore mines to heat our meals. A small ball of the explosive doesn't explode when lit. It burns hot and fast, but I am out of C4. Often we don't get water purification tablets either, but we are used to drinking crappy water. Maybe today we will get some mail when the resupply comes. It has been several days since we received any. I write home infrequently, and when I do, I make stuff up about how everything is fine and not to worry. I always burn my mail after I finish reading it and don't save any photos. If captured or they search my dead body, I don't want it in the hands of the enemy where they may use it against me or threaten my loved ones. If captured, we know we have little value and they will just kill us. I take the P38 can opener on my dog tag chain and open the can. The can opener is the only thing on the chain. My boot laces hold my dog tags on the lower tongue of my jungle boots. If you get blown to shit, your boots and dog tags survive and they can recover them to identify you. I start to eat the ham and motherfuckers and the congealed fat. A voice calls out, LP coming in. I look out and see the three Marines from one of our listening posts approaching our perimeter through the waist high grass. While still keeping an eye out for enemy threats, I hear the activity of our company. We move out soon and everyone is busy eating, smashing sea rat cans, throwing them in our foxholes, relieving ourselves, getting our gear ready for moving out and refilling our foxholes. It has been five days since we had any action. A brief firefight broke out at the head of our column. My location, far back in the column, left me uninvolved. At one point, I looked behind me and saw a bullet kick up dirt right by my left foot. Another kicked up dirt in front of Shorty. No one was killed or wounded during the fight, but later that day, the guy on point tripped a booby trap and had to be medevaced. We still haven't heard if he survived. Today will be like the other 23 days moving most of the day with everything on our backs, searching villages, checking tunnels we find and sweeping through different areas, looking for the enemy. Around 1800, just before dark, we will find our 24th home for the night. We will set up our perimeter, dig our foxholes, eat, smoke a cigarette before dark and send out LPs and ambush teams as the sky darkens. I will take off my boots, peel the damp socks off my feet tie the socks to my pack to dry, and take the dry socks from my pack and put them on, every day switching between the only two pairs of socks I own. The whole company stays awake and alert until 2200, when the watch schedule begins. Since there are just three of us, we each stand a one hour and 20 minutes watch twice, and each night we rotate the order. The second watch is the worst. You sleep three different times, 
twice for one hour and 20 minutes and once for two hours and 40 minutes. In another week or two, the operation ends and I might get to sleep all night for a few days until the next operation. The word spreads around the perimeter, saddle up. I put on my web belt with the shoulder straps. My web bolt belt holds four canteens, a bayonet and a gas mask. Slipping on my flak jacket with the grenades in the lower pockets and a loaded M16 magazine in the upper pocket, I crisscross one bandolier of loaded magazines and one bandolier of ammo clips over it. With the pack and helmet on, I sit on the ground and use the pack like the back of a chair. The can of machine gun ammo assigned for me to carry sits by my left side with a strap tied to the handle made from a bandolier strap. My M16 rests on my right side with a sling also made with, from a bandolier strap. The order comes, move out. I stand up, slinging the ammo can onto my left shoulder and the M16 over my right shoulder with the rifle across the front of me, my hand on it, ready to fire. The column starts moving and we fall into our place. It's already getting hot. Thank you for sharing that with us, Larry. Um, okay, we have one final reader tonight, and that is Ben Simons. Ben Simons is currently living in exile in Prosser, Washington, while he pursues a career as a winemaker. He writes strange fiction and occasional haikus. He is an abuser of commas. All right, Ben, all you. Uh, so I'm going to be reading a uh, chapter from my, yeah, untitled novel. Um, there are multiple naughty words in this piece, as well as a couple of awkward anatomical references. Here I am, standing behind the bar, fingering away at the lump on my neck. I discovered the growth while I was shaving this morning, gazing off into nowhere. It's probably cancer, I think to myself. I know I should feel some kind of anxiety or fear about the malignant tumor festering in my body, but honestly, I don't. I've always known this moment would come. C'est la vie, que sera, sera, yada, yada, yada. I'm going for a smoke. I tell nobody in particular. There isn't really anyone in the bar, so no one in particular really cares. I have been self-diagnosing cancer for almost 30 years now. Symptoms include, but are not limited to, shortness of breath, nausea, persistent headaches, new freckles or discoloration appearing on the bridge of my nose, and of course there are the lumps. The word is always lump or growth. No other words will suffice. I've had lumps show up on my ear, my chest, breast, obviously on my neck, and on one occasion on the shaft of my penis, just beneath the mushroom hat rim. Lung cancer, brain cancer, skin cancer, dick cancer, each diagnosis ushers me into the bardo. I visualize this alien growing inside my body, metastasizing to various organs. My body becomes a skeletal shell and eventually succumbs to the ravages of the tumors growing inside. A ragtag collection of bartenders and barflies congregate at my funeral to lament my passing. It's so sad when someone dies so young. I never go to the doctor to determine the veracity of these diagnoses. I just settle into the cool embrace of the resignation that I am dying. When I walk into the little grassy area on the side of the building, the designated smoking ghetto for the block, Jackson is already there, sitting on a wooden picnic table. I can never bring myself to sit on the table, as every inch seems to be covered in a film of excrement from local pigeons and other feathered creatures. Jackson is a puppy dog in a grizzly bear body. His physique is all whiskey and beer, covered year-round in cargo shorts and flannel shirts, as if to ensure that at least part of him is clothed appropriately at all times. Jackson lives in the same building as me and is something of a neighborhood institution. He has waited tables at the same restaurant for nearly 20 years, and in that time has conscientiously avoided any activity that might give the business owners bright ideas that he is fit for a position of greater responsibility. He is never at risk of getting fired, as he is actually a stud server. The regulars all love him. He is, however, always careful to do the bare minimum required for the successful execution of his job. Just to seal the deal, he will periodically show up for work drunk or in some other state of unfitness to reinforce the notion that he is not to be depended upon. 
What's up, my dude? Jackson growls and hocks up a wad of phlegm, which he projects in a parabolic arc of astonishing distance. I mumble a semi-verbal response and light my camel with a green bic. There was a time in my 20s when a cigarette and lighter were carefully curated items. I selected brands and styles that communicated something about who I was as a person. Lucky strikes, gawasses. I would lean against the brick red walls of the Regent doing that stupid trick with my Zippo, a camel with a K dangling from my lip. There were more complex times, or these were more complex times. My cigarettes have long since ceased to be about reinforcing a crafted identity. Now they are just a pacifier, the defeated shrug of a true addict. You all right? Jackson raises an eyebrow over a pair of Tom Cruise level Ray-Ban aviators. I'd say that you look like shit, but that would be an insult to turds everywhere. I think I might have cancer. Jesus, his forehead wrinkles, then unfurls. He cocks his head in my direction. What makes you think that? I reach to my neck. I found this lump this morning. I run my fingers across the firm protrusion. I don't think it was there yesterday. At least I didn't notice anything. But today there's definitely a lump right here. So does it hurt? A cloud of thin smoke chases the words from his mouth. I hate the gauzy sound his voice makes sometimes when he talks while exhaling smoke. Super gross. Not really. It's a little tender, but not that bad. So do you like feel bad or something? Or is it just the thing? I think for a bit. Well, I've been really tired lately. That tells us like nothing. Dude, you've been telling me how tired you are every day since I met you. That's like three years, bro. That really doesn't tell us shit. I shrug assent. Maybe this isn't the best metric for confirming my diagnosis. The real question, like the thing that might actually give us some usable information to go off of, the real question is, do you feel more tired than usual? I ponder. I have to concede that I don't really feel that much more fatigued than my baseline. Well, man, that kind of swelling could be a lot of things. Jackson has this way about him that is silent simultaneously earnest and dismissive. He sees the world through a specific lens, one where confidence dispels ignorance. Any series of words spoken with enough conviction becomes truth, so let it be written. I have often witnessed Jackson perform this act of verbal transubstantiation and marveled. Like, for example, have you considered that it could be lupus? I shake my head. Have you fucking considered that possibility? I had not, in fact, fucking considered that possibility. I don't even really know what lupus is. Not satisfied that he's made his point, Jackson continues, what about tuberculosis? Do people still get tuberculosis? For some reason, it seems so dated, so passe. Tuberculosis seems Dickensian. Did Dickens write about tuberculosis or am I thinking of consumption? Are those the same thing? It makes me sad to think that the lump on my throat could be something so archaic. Oh, people still get tuberculosis, dude. It's for sure still a thing. People think it's not, but it totally is. If you say so, man. But wouldn't I be coughing or something if I had tuberculosis? Jackson considers this. He coughs. Probably so. But I'm just saying you should explore all your options before deciding you have cancer. Like maybe it's mono, or you could have measles. Or, his back straightens with excitement, maybe you have syphilis. I shake my head and rub the back of my neck. I'm pretty sure I don't have syphilis. I pause, pregnant pause. Let's not get into the reasons why. Fair enough, dude. He holds up his hand and closes his eyes, content to drop the issue. Okay, my dude. He puts his head down and reaches out and rapidly flicks his fingers in universal come here motion. Let's take a look-see at it. No, man, it's okay. I dismiss him with a wave of my cigarette, baptizing the air between us with nicotine. Come on, Austin, get your ass over here and let's take a look. I take a big drag from my cigarette and flick it at the brick wall. Little firebugs explode from the point of impact. I sigh and shuffle over to the shitty bench and expose my neck like a thrall offering a vampire a meal. Jackson reaches a beefy hand up to my face and grabs my chin. His thick yellow fingers are rough and there is a smell of stale smoke that overcomes the aroma of fresh smoke I just left in the air. He pulls my face toward him and I get a close up of his rusty beard. Individual hairs of distressing length jut out in erratic swirls, spiraling in every direction. The smell of nicotine mingles with booze and dive bar fried fish sticks 
fish sticks. Jackson paws at my face and neck for what seems like an eternity, but can't be longer than 10 seconds. There is something about this kind of contact that feels entirely too intimate for this particular relationship. Jackson makes this strange little humming noise that kicks up my level of discomfort by a factor of 10 or so. After performing his too thorough examination, he arrives at a diagnosis. Dude, he kind of chuckles. I think you just have like a swollen gland or something. I, don't, I really don't think you have cancer or even syphilis. How would you know? I pull my face away from his sandpaper fingers, which are still on my face for some reason. I am positively offended by his rejection of my cancer. I am affronted. I would go so far as to say that I am insulted. Does Jackson know that it's what it's like to live with cancer? No, he does not. Jesus, I don't know, man. I just know my mom would always check the same part of my neck and when I was sick, and sometimes she would say that I had swollen glands. Oh, and your mom is what? Like a, what do you call a cancer doctor? Cancer doctor or something? He shakes his head and gives a little shrug. Like, how would your mom even know anything about it? Silence. I have come to grips with my cancer over these last two hours, and this fucking guy and his fucking mom want to deny me that? I am my cancer. My cancer is me. Jackson launches another phlegm rainbow. I wouldn't worry about it, dude. If it gets bigger, or doesn't go away, maybe then I'd freak out, but I'm pretty sure it's nothing. I want to stay angry, to fight for my cancer, but I know he's right. I feel the malignancy dissipate from my body, replaced by a wave of emptiness. I light another cigarette and mourn my loss. If I don't have cancer, what do I have? <laughs> um, thank you, Ben, so much for that. Um, oh man, yeah, that's 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 one of those readings where I'm just really glad that um, I was muted <laughs> for most of it because I was having a lot of uh, reactions there. Um, that is lovely. Um, uh, and thank you, Ben, for being our final reader for the night at our Drop In and Write Get Lit Festival offering. Um, so I, I'm hoping as a group, if everybody wants to unmute themselves for just a second, we can give a round of applause to all our readers tonight. Okay, fantastic. Thank you to John, Ren, Reagan, Hannah, Zanry, Larry, and Ben. Um, some phenomenal work uh, coming from all of you. And um, thanks for being such a great part of this community. And thanks to everybody who showed up to support tonight. Um, drop in and write, um, just to reiterate for anyone who's watching on the interwebs at any point in the future, um, is absolutely open to anybody who has any interest in writing whatsoever. Um, so feel free to join us. Um, I'm sure there's a link around here somewhere. Um, any Tuesday night, between 5.30 and 7 p.m. And I'm gonna say a final thank you to Get Lit um, for including this reading in the festival. And anyone who's watching this can learn more about Get Lit and donate to help support next year's in-person festival, which will surely feature an event at Spark Central by visiting getlitfestival.org. So thank you to our readers, thank you to Get Lit, thank you to Spark Central, what a magical night. Bye for now. Bye.